Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Vet Squared uh, Innovate Podcasts. This series is here because we're trying to support veterinarians in three main areas. Um, one is self and, and business leadership. The other is basic business skill. And the final one, which is um, emotional fitness. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, this evening my guest, um, Dr. Mark Johnston. I met Mark many years ago back in South Africa, mainly through my association with, with VetStream. I believe it's now called um, Vet Lexicon, uh, an incredible 27,000 um, peer reviewed referenced articles sourced from, from 1,100 world leading veterinary clinicians, giving you um, diagnoses and treatments. And it also includes owner fact sheets for owners, covers 30 body systems, and helps veterinarians with diagnosis, treatment, and also helps them communicate with their owners. So I met Mark through that wonderful um, project to the profession. Um, and Mark, I just wondered, when I first met you, I didn't know that you were a veterinarian. I presumed that you were just the founder of, of VetStream. So yeah. um, I guess my first question to you is, um, how did you move from being a clinical veterinarian into something like VetStream and all the other projects which you do? Yeah, okay. Um, well, nice to be on the podcast too, Larry. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I suppose the uh, the truth is that uh, uh, going back to my sort of fundamentals of um, vet school, Cambridge, left, joined um, first opinion equine practice immediately. I didn't um, uh, have to um, go into mixed practice or small animal practice, which I was not interested in in the slightest. I just wanted to do horse work. And so um, I did first opinion work um, for... Um, about nine months and at the time um, I was uh, a, I suppose pro in the last year or so at Cambridge I did a research project um, with uh, Rossdale and Partners in Newmarket about assessing fitness of uh, polar ponies through um, measuring their um, routine bloods and um, uh, and that sort of thing and at the time um, David Snow who was an Australian exercise physiologist probably the only exercise physiologist equine physio equine exercise physiologist in the world um uh, was working with one of the trainers in Newmarket and had just decided his wife had decided that she couldn't stay in the weather and needed to go to Australia so um they were looking for someone to replace him so I came up to um, be interviewed at a rather tender age to be um at the exercise physiologist in-house for this particular trainer I met the trainer and thought mm, I'm not sure this is going to go particularly uh, easily because um, I'm not very experienced and um, I didn't think it was going to necessarily work so I ended up saying to Rostels look I'm really interested in the topic I'm really interested in um, working in Newmarket and for, uh, but I'm, I think it'd be better if I work for the practice not the trainer um, and I started then doing um, anesthesia uh, for the um, the surgeon Tim Greet um, and helping him basically as his intern and uh, he hadn't had uh, one of those um, to, to help him run his referral surgical clinics or this particular trainer so it, it seemed to work quite well anyway um, the surgery really uh, started getting motoring hard and uh, doing really really well um, which was uh, great for the practice, but um, it quickly became apparent um, after um, about five years of this that I was, it wasn't doing particularly well for me. Um, and I didn't really recognize any of the symptoms um, and uh, just found I was beginning to really hate um, the wicked world um, uh, and my clinical work, which is a bit of a shame since I dedicated my whole life to it. So I quickly realized before um, uh, any deeper into the brown stuff um, I would have to uh, change direction and so I changed direction um, applied for some funding to do some research I was actually starting when I was at, at Rosdale's into anesthetic deaths in horses and um, a number of uh, wonderful practices decided that they would share their 
um, their data uh, with this person they probably never met, um, who was doing the confidential inquiry into perioperative equine fatalities, which is what we named the study. And I did that for about five or six years. And I then, um, we collected a, a mass of data from about 147 clinics, equine clinics around the world, some practices, some vet schools. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized that this was called epidemiology and I'm as about as numerate as a caterpillar. Um, I am not suited for this sort of stuff. So I luckily had some wonderful people around me who helped me do the statistics and we came up with some useful information. And I quickly realized that life in academia was not going to be the um, the future. Um, um, and so while I was doing that, I had seen in practice a business which you had quite rightly said, uh, the business was called Vetstream, the product was called Vetstream. And um, uh, I realized that actually what I had done in my research project, which is collect data from people and then feed it back into practice so that they could improve their practice, was what I was quite interested in. And guess what? That stream was trying to do the same thing. It was trying to take um, information from key opinion leaders and, uh, and put it into a format that was um, uh, peer reviewed, multimedia, uh, kept up to date the whole time um, and, uh, and cross linked to all sorts of other content. And the wonderful John Grieve, whose idea it was, um, back in the late 90s um, thought that, uh, that this information could be beamed down by satellite, um, uh, which was uh, probably uh, enough evidence to have him locked up um, and to, to learn how to come to terms with his frustrations. Well, that's a bit weird, isn't it, if you think about it now, when we all have these lovely, lovely smartphone devices where, guess what, the information is not beamed down from satellite, but actually provided um, via mobile signal, and um, John was right all the way along. Um, so I joined the Vetstream business, which was intending to break the mold of, of, of what paper publishing was doing, which is basically produce a book on internal medicine and write it like a, a series of structured uh, chapters and have an index at the back. And that's about, you know, with some images, but that wasn't really John's idea. John's idea was have something explore from the center of the concept you're trying to look at and then branch out into other things and not be limited by page structure or um, the limitations of a book. And mm -hmm. so I became more and more interested in that and joined as part of the fundraising team and, and I've been involved with it pretty much ever since. Um, and it's, it's all about trying to support clinical teams, both vets, uh, veterinarians, and uh, nurses stroke technicians if you're in North America. And uh, so th that was all about helping uh, veterinary practices really do their, um, provide the best uh, optimal care they could for their patients and enjoy uh, their clinical work because they would have access to the information they needed right at the point of care and not have to go scurrying around looking at journals and textbooks or phoning referral uh, clinicians that weren't available because they were too busy. Um, so that's where I got involved in all the um, the vet stream side of things. And we did uh, subsequently realize we were confusing people by calling the company vet stream and the service vet stream. So we actually changed it um, to a more uh, a lexicon um, uh, because I think what we provide probably is some form of lexicon and it's not a nautical one that you might be used to if you're into yachting um, and boats and things so we called it vet lexicon and it seems so far to describe what um, the service is, is uh, and, and works as a, as a brand I hope um, and then I guess we have been doing that for a number of years now and as you um, uh, rightly say we've got about 27,000 um, items of content all peer-reviewed articles images videos sounds diagnostic trees all those sorts of things um, to try and help people wherever they are whether at home or whether they're in the practice um, and so that's that's how I got involved in the vet stream business and and, and where we are now with subscribers um, in, in many different countries um, and uh, and as a WSAVA um, educational partner. I've I've absolutely loved it from the day I first saw it um, as a busy practitioner to have that resource and now with the ability of technology to bring it to you instantaneously. Um, in a discussion that I had with you, you mentioned that you 
it may now become part of certain software systems as opposed to being um, on its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we now have the ability to be able to, um, I mean, obviously, username and the password is the, the most uh, normal way of authenticating, but um, we now can do um, integrations into um, PIMS, um, uh, and uh, we can also link into other systems using single sign-on, um, and we also can provide authentication with um, IP addresses, so IP authentication, um, and increasingly, it, it's very easy for um, us to integrate into the practice management systems, and it just means it adds value because the content is then in the workflow, clinical workflow of uh, of the of the practice team, um, mm. and so if they're looking at a case, going, mm, I don't really like the look of this, or just need to check something, um, then they can just flip straight into our content, uh, look it up, and more importantly, perhaps share that content with the client so that they're involved in the journey as well, which really helps their understanding and their compliance with um, the recommendations that the clinical team are coming up with. So I think embedding the content, if one can, into the practice management systems um, mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. I'm a surgeon, so I, lo I love the certainty that the that the the structure and the framework gives you when you're dealing with the case. It just uh, it's not a template, but it's a, a very strong period. Well, they're guidelines that you I, can use. Yeah. yeah, I think I think as you say, it's not really templates. It's all about it's it's an a, it's guidelines. Um, it's a sort of framework. Um, look, have you got the uh, equipment to do this surgery? Have you got the sort of surgical experience and confidence? Um, and, and more importantly, perhaps the nursing backup uh, afterwards, if it's a particularly technical procedure that's going to require a lot of aftercare, are you able to provide that within your facility um, uh, with 24-7 cover, or would it be better for that procedure to be um, carried out um, in, in a different facility? Uh, sometimes you don't have the, the, the choice, um, but if you do have the choice, it, it just gives you a chance of tips and warnings to just keep you on track, um, images of key moments in the, in the procedures, sometimes videos, um, uh, but you know, just to be able to um, understand the, the, the full breadth and um, uh, issues that you might encounter during the surgery, but every single operation, whether or diagnostic or surgical technique is the same template. So that the uh, equipment, the procedure, the aftercare, the um, consequences, the references, all of those, every single one of those headings is with every single diagnostic and surgical technique. Every single um, disease has the, um, the history, the clinical signs, um, the etiology, the differential diagnosis. So every single one of those templates um, is uh, adhered to for all the content. And that just means that everyone can find the information they want, hopefully as quickly and easily as they, as they can. Mm. I know that um, when I first saw it, the price seemed a little bit high, certainly being in you know, um, South Africa, it was a kind of UK pound based product. Now with it, um, with you having, I guess, more, um, more uh, market mass and being able to share it through software programs. Is the price now more affordable? Is it something, if I said, okay, I want this product, how do I, how would I get access to it other than getting, purchasing a license and having a user login and password? Yeah, so- um, Are there any uh, we, software programs currently that it's linked to? Yeah, the, the, we basically, it is, it, is a, uh, it is a subscription service and we have um, essentially, um, got two ways of um, for practices to subscribe. One is um, as well as an individual person, and that pricing is on the vetlexicon.com um, forward slash plans forward slash subscribe hyphen now, and that shows the pricing of what it is. And we basically have made a small animal bundle um, so that they can have the four companion animal services of Canis and Felis, Lapis the rabbit service and exotis which has guinea pigs ferrets and reptiles um all in um uh, the the same value as um uh, as two of the services so um those are available to pay monthly or annually but we um we also have a a, a pricing structure that works for practices 
um, and so the whole practice team can um, access it for not much more um, than the price of an individual uh, subscription. Um, and we also have tiered pricing depending on whether people are part of um, a, a group um, like yours, Larry, the um, IVPD, or you happen to be part of a large uh, um, practice group, or you happen to be um, a, an equine association in Czechoslovakia. Uh, we have pricing to, to really um, make it more affordable. Uh, we, we are actually one of the consequences of the economic chaos in, in the UK recently. <laughs> Um, thanks to our politicians, God bless them, um, is that the pound now is a lot weaker. And so the pricing that we did provide in pounds um, has now bec become reduced. Um, but we've really priced it according to um, the price of a, maybe a decent textbook um, uh, on, a, on a species. So I really, um, we're not being told pricing is as much of an issue as it might have been previously. We're really trying um, to make it very much more affordable for folk um, because there's no point having an expensive Rolls Royce in the drive um, you're never going to um, you know, use it drive it or anything um, uh, whereas if you have uh, a more sensibly priced um, medium range um, pricing structure then lots more people will benefit from using it um, mm -hmm. so we, we, we've we've rationalized our pricing very significantly now um, and I hope it's uh, wherever you are in the world we also have a through our relationship with the uh, world small animal veterinary association we tier the pricing so that those in the less economically developed countries um and in fact some of those that are the the lowest uh, tier um are provided with it free of charge um as our um, contribution to um the profession generally and then as you go through the the tiers of economic development then the pricing um changes but um, we always try and make it um a, a non-pricing um uh, issue really i'm going to go off on a completely different tack when i first met you i was also always keen to find ways to support veterinarians anything to support veterinarians they're brilliant technically they they're passionate about what they do and the teams that they work with and yet moving along even now especially after covid we have this terrible um, anxiety stress sadly even suicide situation and one wonders with all of these new developments with all of these new systems all of these new toys um why is it um and i know this is a really broad question but <laughs> why is it that that veterinarians and veterinary teams still suffer so much with um, anxiety and with depression and with sadly even suicide. Yeah, I mean, as you say, it's a massive question, uh, Larry. But I mean, I I, bet, I guess the only way I can uh, answer that is is my personal uh, response because I can't um, and wouldn't dream of trying to understand um, others. I'm not a mental health um um professional and certainly not qualified to comment but um i guess what happened to to me is is maybe um similar to others i don't know but i i basically had joined um, a high performing practice i was doing a high performance job um delivering all of the anesthesia and critical care for the patients in um uh, uh, the horse uh, population of newmarket and the referral uh, caseload that came in and uh, I had uh, made that pretty much my focus and to the detriment of anything outside of um, my work so uh, sleep being the most uh, obvious one um, because between February the 15th uh, my birthday and the 1st of July in Newmarket we call it the stud it's called the stud season when um, the um, horse is typically um, uh, our, um, the foals are able to be, um, thoroughbred foals are able to be born and, and that's the 15th of February that afterwards they can be, um, that's when their birthday is, which seems a bit weird, doesn't it? Um, so that period on, those months are absolutely frenetic um, and it coincides with horses um, go in the Northern Hemisphere, that's the, the peak training time coming up to the flat racing season. Um, it's also in the grasses, um, uh, growing fairly 
uh, energetically in spring and into summer. So we have a lot of abdominal um, uh, issues. Um, so essentially uh, a lot of out of hours emergency work. So, um, and even we didn't really have being off duty then. Um, uh, and this is back in the, um, the, the, the late eighties, the early nineties. So you just, you just carried on and um, you might've been asleep in your bed or about to go to bed and uh, you'd suddenly get a call and you'd be expected to go in. And, um, and I remember Tim Greet and I both saying, look, this is, uh, this is a hobby as well as our job. Um, the only trouble was that the, um, uh, and so you go without sleep for most of the night and then you turn up um, at whatever normal opening at the sort of starting hours the next day and then maybe go and even see the same trainer with um, uh, the horse that you've been operating on the previous night. And, um, and and they wouldn't really fully appreciate that you had been up all night trying to rescue um, <laughs> the life of their, um, one of their um, animals um, and expect you to look at all their lame horses or, um, you know, respiratory problems or whatever the issues were. So um, I think the big one is really... Um, is sleep. Uh, I keep hearing that uh, in all the investigations I have had um, into mental health. Um, and so that was one I um, basically had ignored. Um, I didn't have any outside interests apart from work because there just simply wasn't uh, the available time. Um, and so I guess I became a bit isolated. Um, and then um, I guess the other things are that one was pretty much uh, at the peak of one's enthusiasm for the profession. Um, and so um, it seemed a bit weird to me also that here I was nine, ten months after graduating as the um, uh, anaesthetist and critical care guy at the leading, um, one of the leading equine hospitals um, in Newmarket in the UK. So there was a weeny bit of imposter syndrome sitting around on the, um, uh, in my head. Um, and so, and, and the demands were very much on one to perform. Um, and I also think there was a strong element in me in um, what what I've now discovered um, to be called the fixed mindset rather than a growth mindset. So um, I um, I didn't understand that things might go wrong um, because you know you'd been trained well, um, you'd passed your exams, although goodness knows how I did, but apparently I did, um, and uh, you were doing your clinical work. Um, and then suddenly, out of the blue, a catastrophe would uh, would uh, arise. And so, you know, you're always being told up to when you were at vet school, you know, how um, good you were, how bright you were, how clever you were, all these other um, adjectives. And then all of a sudden, when uh, a, a catastrophe strikes, um, you're suddenly the flip side of, of being all of those good things. You're suddenly um, useless. Um, and, and, you know, uh, hopeless and um, got it wrong and all, all of these other things. And I think a lot of us, and I count myself as being one of them, was, was being told all of those good adjectives and then suddenly the world spun in a different direction and you were, I was not equipped to handle them. And um, it would have been a lot better if we'd all had um, the growth mindset um, imposed where we were told that we were doing well we were showing our um, uh, growth we were um, you know we'd worked up that case really well um, or that we had um, anesthetized it and it, it had uh, got onto its feet in in um, in a really good way and so all of the verb um, praises rather than the um, the nouns and and I think that's something that I've really taken on board over the years is it's very very uh, important in in to use the right words in many situations and I think um, because one was working in that environment one was particularly uh, keen to keep up that record so when things went wrong you took it quite personally um, and then one was very tired and then one was isolated um, because there weren't many other um, people of uh, doing anesthesia and critical care in horses then um, and I then realized that I, now, although not then, that I was just, I was burning out. Um, and it's a word we've, a uh, phrase we've heard a lot more recently. Um, but I'm absolutely convinced that's what I was doing. Um, now I was absolutely fed up with, uh, doing what I was doing. I hated it. I wanted to, to really, uh, uh, not do it anymore. I had no idea 
what was happening to me or anything. Um, and I think some of us, uh, it's a slippery slope as the phrase goes, and mm -hmm. it's a very gradual slope and it starts very gradually. Um, and then if colleagues aren't being maybe as supportive as they could be, or you get one or two uh, comments from clients, either privately and directly at you or worst, um, mm -hmm. Uh, out on the internet um, and they um, you know the cyber bullying the uh, the bad reviews and the naming and shaming um, all of those sorts of things are uh, not helpful and so you it's a whole conspiracy of, uh, of of elements that that really do conspire um, and so I don't think it's any one thing mm. I think there are lots of things and there are many more too but all I can comment on us on what happened to me and I, I gradually just went further and further down um, and I suddenly realized this is not okay this is not good and and to put a bit of context around this Larry is that my uh, early childhood was somewhat uh, damaged um, uh, when I was 10 my father took his own life um, uh, with a shotgun and uh, I was uh, not really given the full truth at the time for obvious reasons. This was back in 1972. Um, su suicide um, was a taboo word, and uh, it was still very, uh, still a, a, a sort of a disgraced um, action. And so one was living with quite a lot of uh, uh, damaged um uh aspects to my uh, life although i you, you you learn pretty quickly how to cope with many things after that has happened um so there was quite a lot of history of um uh how how that had impacted me and i pretty much put it behind me um and, and carried on to do my studies it almost in fact it probably drove me to make sure that i really did achieve because um, my dad was, you know, in his uh, early 30s um, when when this happened and I was 10. Um, and it was never really with any um, uh, explanation. Um, uh, uh, there were no, was no letter. Um, there was no, you know, evidence as to why he'd done it. We all had our sort of thoughts. I was told it was a shooting accident while he was cleaning his gun. Um, which I guess was a, a helpful euphemism at the time. Um, uh, I didn't really believe that because you don't clean your gun with a shot with a, um, a um, uh, cartridge in it, do you? Um, anyway, uh, one didn't know the consequences then, but I'm pretty sure I knew what the uh, what had mm -hmm. happened. Um, so I had that in the back of my mind um, lurking, and I strangely something has just happened recently, which some of you on Facebook may have even seen, but. It has really surprised me. Um, I was minding my own business um, and uh, in the bathroom and um, uh, going through my phone, just making sure I was sorted out for the day. And there was a picture by um, one of, I'm a, a keen amateur photographer and a lovely lady, uh, Jackie Gilman had posted a picture of the um, Northern Lights, um, which had appeared just um, around Berry Snedmans. Now, any of you who know where that is, it's, on the level of Cambridge pretty much in the UK. It's pretty unusual for us to see the Northern Lights as far south as that. And Jackie had managed to take a, a, a stunning photograph of it um, just north of Bury. And she posted on social media, it had got picked up by the BBC and others. And um, when uh, this had happened, uh, quite a number of people locally in Bury had seen the picture as well. One of them reached out to Jackie. Um, I'm, it's not a Ronnie, Corbett story this I will get to the point I promise you um, uh, and said Jackie um, I wonder whether you'd be able to go and uh, pop in on um, somebody in in the village just north of where you are um, they've had a bit of a, 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 a catastrophe their father um, died of a brain tumor um, last week and they've got quite a young family um, and you're just thinking your picture might be something that they would they would like um, and so Jackie said well if you think it might help I will yeah so she um, knocked on the door and, and they were, uh, were greeted by the, um, the family, obviously, in a, in a fairly dire state. And um, Jackie didn't know how to introduce the, the, the image or anything or why she was there. So she did her best to do it gently and, um, and showed them the picture. And 
the picture is, is an absolutely gorgeous picture of the Northern Lights over the house um, and numerous other houses in the village of Stanton. Um, and this little boy who was 10 um, uh, suddenly said, that's, you know, when she explained what it was, she said, that's daddy, that's daddy. And of, of course, the weird thing was that the Northern Lights had appeared a day after this little boy's father had died. Well, when I was reading this story, I'm, I'm just about able to keep control of it now, but I, it hit me. This is 50 years later. I had not cried like I was now crying and sobbing um, since my father's funeral. When I watched all these other strange people in my father's uh, funeral um, uh, who I'd never met before, all looking um, as though they needed to be there, but I didn't have a clue who any of them were. And I was, ne I'd never been so upset since that moment, 50 years ago, as I was at 10 past six um, uh, that morning. And it struck me absolutely smack um, like a bulldozer uh, in a way that I was completely unexpecting. And uh, my wife calls those um, crochet hook moments. And those of you who are familiar with knitting might be familiar with the, the crochet hook, um, which just enables you to um, go in and, and uh, do a bit of uh, technical um, aspects of knitting. And it goes through the chain mail um, of one's armour that one has about one. And this, this, this story, just reading this, just absolutely crochet hooked me. Um, and I was just in, I was in bits, literally for half, three quarters of an hour, just uncontrollable. And I just thought, this is, how on earth has this been sitting there um, without me realising? And how on earth can this be triggered so, so strongly? Um, and I think that's the thing that astonishes me about mental health. Um, and I did post this story um, on my um, sort of Facebook feed because so many of our profession are having um, a really tough time. And it illustrates to me, it's not, I mean, that, and this sounds weird, and I hope people take this the right way, but the mortality of someone taking their life through suicide um, is absolutely devastating and tragic. But mm -hmm. the burden of morbidity is, to me, much, much more serious. Um, and and I, I think I'm, I was astonished that 50 years did not provide any healing, and it could be triggered quite so unexpectedly by something that just appeared uh, like a black swan, as the as the the famous story goes, um, just came into my uh, being, my pre my my presence, and I, it just triggered me for uh, at the most fundamental emotional expression. And and I'm I am I suppose a reasonably emotionally intelligent creature, um, uh, or as much as I can be. Um, but this blew me away. It was absolutely astonishing the impact it had on me. So I think. There are triggers that are sitting out there that we're not aware of um, uh, um, necessarily, and it just it just caught me out, and it just reaffirmed my interest in in the whole mental health or ill health um, of of many folk in our in our profession, and uh, reaffirmed why I did set up a while ago a project which I didn't. Um, really know where it was going to go but I started collecting about five years ago information about um, uh, mental uh, health of the profession resources that different organizations had collected and were providing um, and they're all different um, uh, uh, and many of them um, have uh, they're, they're just initiatives and projects that people have tried to do to get going in all the right way um, and I just started collecting this information and as a digital publisher of course I put them into a sort of um, a, 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 a location where I could access it reasonably easily and having having got all this together and some of them were TED talks you know a classic example is um, uh, Monica Lewinsky um, talking about cyberbullying and you might think what the hell's that got to do with anything in veterinary medicine um, and she had a pretty uh, miserable time after that story broke from all the folk on social media and I thought uh, that it was very interesting her describing how to cope with cyberbullying because it's happening right now from the general public who are you know owners and clients of our practices saying things that 
they may mean or they may not mean, but the impact that that's having on all of us um, at the sharp end of trying to do our best for their, their animals is absolutely massive. So on the one hand that, on the other hand, um, uh, tools to help you sleep better or um, people discussing their eating disorders or um, their, uh, their addictions to either alcohol or um, other recreational pharmaceuticals or their dependency on um, all sorts of other um, elements, self-harm self being a, a, um, another topic that we cover. So I started collecting all of this information and I thought we've got to do this in some way that is going to make it available more to people um, in, in a way that's going to um, enable them to start the journey, which is what I was, I'd struggled to do when I burnt out. There was no, I didn't, I didn't even know there was anything wrong with me. I just thought I was just being a miserable git, which I probably was. Um, and, um, but I didn't know how to, you know, what it was or anything. I just thought I'm just being, you know, a wimp, um, you know, stiff up a lip, get on with it, be British um, and, uh, and you'll be fine. Of course you'll be fine. Um, but of course, again, uh, as my wife regularly says, yes, uh, we all know uh, that fine doesn't mean fine. Fine means, sorry for the language, fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> so um, uh, so I, I put all this together. So apologies if I've insulted anyone, but hopefully you'll see the context. Um, I put this together and formed what um, we've now called the Vets in Mind Alliance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. as a not-for-profit um but it's uh um is essentially to provide the tools to help folk um understand where they might be um on the on the on the range of uh, mental ill health normal abnormal and and um really quite unwell um or uh and and give them the tools to try and understand it i think as uh, um as veterinarians we are trained quite well in the science and um so to give us tools to be able to understand our own health um uh, as in in the same sort of context as the tools that we were given to understand the health of our patients mm -hmm. i felt might be useful so i put this together and made it available via an um an app that um had been funded uh, by the pet plan uh charitable trust and by the North American veterinary community um, and Circa Healthcare and they all put funds together to support what we were what I was trying to do um, and it also became a bit clear that I was um, I'd basically thrown mud at the wall I didn't there wasn't really any structure any strategy um, it was just a um, an attempt to pull content together and it, it was in they were in uh, resource tabs for people to access and there were um, uh, phone numbers of different countries where helplines could be found and there were um, videos and, and recordings of people describing their own um, uh, journey um, whether it was working as someone with Asperger's whether it was somebody with eating disorders whether it was so lots of veterinarians talking about their particular uh, journey but I fortunately came across um, a lady called Donna Gurney, um, who is um, a clinical psychologist and had spent a number of years supporting the mental health of, um, of uh, those in the veterinary profession, the veterinary market, as well as um, doctors. And um, she was very um, clear in her um, uh, ambition to help us in the veterinary market. She's married to somebody who works in one of the uh, veterinary pharmaceutical um, companies, uh, Nextmune, and um, Donna was very keen to try and help and and almost um, uh, steer me in the right direction would be uh, an understatement. Um, and and she basically said, look, what you've got is fine, Mark, but actually doesn't help people get started. And what we do have um, in clinical psychology now is a series of very va well validated triage tools for mm. people to be able to start their journey to see whether they themselves or a colleague that they're worried about or a member of their fa family or a friend um, and frankly we're all in this community together for a short space of time of however long we're allowed to live on this planet um, to help people get a little bit more um, understanding of, of are they okay are they not okay 
do they, you know, what, what is it that they're experiencing? And that was the situation with me. I had no idea what I was experiencing. It just felt like I was being miserable um, and uh, I'd lost my mojo. So we have set up on the Vets in Mind uh, website, um, and it's also, uh, they are also on the, um, the app themselves, um, a series of six um, triage tools. We have a sort of an overall one um, on uh, an overall mental health screening tool. And then we have others on, for anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, burnout, suicidal thoughts and, and stress. And those tools are there, they're completely and utterly safe and secure to use. There is no recording of data, there is no, uh, it is for individuals to use um, uh, uh, privately when they want to in the way that they want. And I just, we decided to put it on the app because we wanted to uh, enable people to um, be able to go into a private space, probably on their smartphones, because we all have one these days, and we're more likely to do something very personal on a smartphone rather than on the desktop within the consulting room of the practice where everyone's going to potentially walk past going, oh, what are you looking at that for? Um, you're not thinking of taking your own life, are you? Ho, ho, ho. Um, and other such inappropriate comments. Um, you're more likely to be in the car on your own or you know, maybe in the, um, in, the, in the bathroom, in the loo, um, uh, on your own and a smartphone access to some of those tools might be helpful. And then at the end of these um, validated tools, there's, and the papers that are used to reference that are, are all shown as well. So folk can go and have a look at them and see what they mean. Is they come up with an ob objective score, a value, which then, again, well validated as far as they can be, signpost people to say, why don't you have a look at a bit of self-directed um, uh, care and ways of doing things on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, on the uh, mid-range, it might be, might be an idea to have a chat with your, your primary care clinician, or as we call them, general practitioner. Uh, and then at the upper level, it might be, why don't you think about calling the emergency service or getting one of your friends to take you directly to um, uh, the emergency room or accidental emergency to avoid a, um, a, a catastrophe. So those are there to be used by anybody. Um, they don't collect any data. Um, they are uh, completely and utterly out there for folk to use. And I don't, we don't really mind if, if people are outside the veterinary profession are using it. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, um, something for, for us all to use. And so the start of the Vets in Mind um, journey has been a gestation period where we've collected this information together as resources. And now we've got these triage tools um, and we're now looking at trying to work out how we can make these known about widely. And thank you, Larry, for this um, podcast. Mm. And then to widen it out with people um, in associations, um, in practice groups, um, and uh, any other um, uh, avenue that we can. And then from there, the, we, we don't as yet have any clear plans as to what else the Alliance is going to uh, be trying to do. And I'm, I'm blessed with an incredible variety of trustees, it so happens. Um, uh, I've been really blessed with diversity. Um, uh, Donna Gurney um, is um, a clinical psychologist who um, was from the Philippines um, and uh, has a lot of uh, different cultural uh, background as, as regards that. Um, uh, Vicky Robinson is uh, UK based, um, worked in uh, various practices in the UK and, um, and so is a UK based colleague um, uh, with Vet Dynamics. Um, Shidi Gardner came from South Africa um, and is uh, a black veterinarian who's now very prominent in the UK um, uh, in the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons um, and uh, very involved in, in the whole uh, um, inclusiveness um, and um, uh, diversity and, and, and uh, uh, aspects of, of veterinary practices. She's experienced it very much the first hand with her demographic. Um, and then uh, others, Navisha Shergill is a um, soon to be graduate in Indonesia. She was the uh, chairperson of the 
Wellness Committee, Standing Committee on Mental um, Wellness for the International Veterinary Student Association. So she brings a really important um, gender and age demographic that is completely different from, from me anyway. Um, and then we have two other colleagues, um, uh, one Steve Curtin, um, who is, um, runs an advertising and marketing agency in um, the USA and UK uh, called Circa Healthcare. And then um, uh, Ivan um, Zach, who um, has uh, set up a, a practice group going about really focusing on the mental health and support of uh, all team members in the practice called Galaxy Vets. So um, as a group, we really, uh, I hope, um, have many different voices from very many different um, uh, sources. Um, and we all come together and we're all very, very determined uh, to try uh, and be there and to do things that are going to make a material difference to what practices have got uh, to, uh, to handle and, and where we all are um, as we go through our careers and afterwards, because many of us hopefully are going to live a long life uh, after we've finished our clinical career and play maybe an important part in, in the profession um, thereafter as well. Um, so that's where we were, um, that's where we got to and, and what we're trying to achieve. When I started this, um, this podcast series and there are a lot of vet podcast series, it was really about finding um, people that had, that had influenced my life and I still believe are influencing and I just, I just can't believe from um, your description. Sometimes I think you almost have to face a disaster in order to see what comes out of it. You're in that stressful equine environment. You made something of it. Vet stream was born out of that environment. Um, and thank you so much for the courageous share about your dad. I mean, I, I can't imagine. Um, and how your your deep connection with veterinary mental health comes from a very personal space. Well, so I think it, okay, well, I, is, just, it's in mind has a long way to go. <laughs> well, it so was very interesting, done. Barry. It was very interesting to me when I was starting on this journey. There were one or two folk who misjudged me, I guess. Um, and because I'm a digital publisher, they thought I was trying to make money out of mental health. Um, and uh, so that that actually was an interesting um, uh, <laughs> uh, message to hear. So I thought, actually, I'm going to be really quite um, direct in my responses to, to folk like that. And I didn't really understand because one or two people, I just felt, you know, people were trying to sort of brush past me or ignore me when I was uh, talking about it or was, uh, was approaching them. And uh, a lovely lady, Carolyn Crow in the UK said to me, Mark, you don't realize, do you? you? You have no idea that people think you're doing this for financial reasons. And I said, what do you mean financial reasons? I put more time, effort and money myself into this project. There is no, there's no financial benefit and there never will be. This is a not for profit. And she said, people are assuming that you're doing this. Um, and she said, I've heard it being said. And I said, OK, enough. So that's when I started being really quite open about my experience um, personally of burnout and also of my dad's experience because I think too many of our colleagues were losing through mental ill health either uh, the morbidity of it and and were just not coping with working uh, mm -hmm. in the career that we thought we were going to spend the rest of our lives in or tragically taking our own lives so I have no embarrassment um, and uh, I'm and I thought well if I, as a reasonably well-known person in some parts of the profession, am happy to disclose my situation, then it might just help a few others realize that you can pivot and change direction. You can seek help and not be um, uh, demonized for um, putting your hand up saying, I'm not okay. Um, uh, and so it, it, it may, I, I just hope it does help. I just hope it is a contribution to what we're doing. And we're now very much trying to work as collaborators um, and filling in the jigsaw piece of what I don't think we fully understand, going back to one of your original questions, Larry. I don't think we really understand all of the elements mm. that are contributing factors to, to mental ill health. Um, but I think we're beginning to piece some of them together. Um, mm. And there are many folk, um, uh, um, there's another very interesting man, Jason Spenderlow, 
who is another clinical psychologist who is based at Harper and Keel, and he is doing his level best at the new vet school there to help um, provide a wellness toolkit, particularly for the students coming into his vet school so that they go into their practicing, their professional life with some of the tools that will help them cope with um, their um, their experiences that they're going to they're going to find and um, Jason's been very um, he's a Kiwi um, and uh, based in the UK and he's been very interested in what we're doing and I hope we're going to find ways to collaborate closely with uh, with his wellness kit um, and and many other organizations um, around the world too um, the not one more vet um, colleagues in in North America the I mean there are lots of vet life in the UK is very very well known in the UK um, we're trying to all work together and there's there is a big uh, problem to solve and I think we just need to sit back objectively and go what are the things that um, are, are not we're not thinking about properly and as I say that I just I tell the, my personal story because I'm not the clinical psychologist to give you the um, you know the, the the authentic answer based on evidence and everything else all I can talk about is my own personal story um, and that may resonate with some people or they may go I have no idea what any of that means and it may be different factors for them but I think we're all very high performing folk and um, and and determined to do a good job um, in, in many of our uh, different ways we act as professionals and I think factors come into play that sometimes catch us unawares um, or just creep up on us um, and I, I think we we do need to do the right thing for ourselves and build the um, the foundations um, uh, to our mental health um, and some of that is based on our physical health as well um, and we're sometimes not great at looking after our physical health um, and we focus too hard on um, other things and, and let our uh, dependencies of um, uh, on, on other aspects get in get in the way I think we there's a we owe it to ourselves if we're going to study for you know however long it is to be a, a veterinary nurse and technician um, and however long it is to be a veterinarian or veterinary surgeons we we tend to call them in the UK you know that's numerous years of intense study sometimes also with additional jobs on the side to pay for it by the way um, mm. We are pushing ourselves pretty hard in whatever aspect of the the veterinary world that we're working in, and uh, I think we owe it to ourselves to go. Okay, I'm studying really hard. What else do I need to do to make sure that I'm a a rounded, capable person that's going to be um, a, a, con able to contribute and feel as though they want to enjoy contributing um, mm -hmm. for the remainder of my um, time on on this lovely planet. Um, uh, and to to not get myself into into trouble uh, mentally or physically um, through through not realizing that I should have done things differently um, and I guess that's where that's where I see it is um, you know we we're all putting in a lot of effort um, we're trying to do our best for our patients and our clients mm -hmm. um, fundamentally we need to look after ourselves in a good way as well and this isn't being wokish and woe is me and oh I can't work on a Saturday mm -hmm. it's system needs to think clearly um, mm. uh, about how to to make a new world um, think differently and, and mainly through COVID I think we've all reviewed the way we do things um, and mm. I think there is there's some real opportunities for us to to go hang on that doesn't make sense doing things like that anymore oh we can't afford to have more people okay maybe we can't afford to have more people maybe we structure the working hours that were available differently or maybe we you know we just adjust things we have to say what we can do and not you know have the the dreadful phrase computer says no or can't do um i'm so bored of hearing people saying oh no no we can't do that or that's not possible yes it is almost everything's possible if we actually have a can-do approach and it's it's just so boring hearing people saying, you know, oh, no, I'm not allowed to do that. Yes, you are. Yes. You know, of course you can do it. Um, have a chat with someone. And, and what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to say, yeah, that's a bit tricky, Larry. You might come back to that one or, you know, but talk to folk. 
talk to folk about your issues, the things that aren't working in the practice, be kind and respectful to your colleagues and clients. Some of them may not be kind back to you, but just let that wash away and, and share it maybe with a colleague afterwards to, uh, to offload it. But mm -hmm. just, you know, I think we, we're blessed with this, you know, here am I looking out on this lovely sunny day today. Um, it's morning for me in the UK. Uh, and it's, you know, you, we, we are, we're, we're, we're blessed to be on this place and to be able to do what we do. And my vision, I guess, is to just uh, uh, enjoy that myself and hopefully share that with others. My mission is really to enable folk who are also in the veterinary community. And they may also be, by the way, in pharmaceutical companies, they may work for the state government, they may, uh, in, in, in many other elements, um, uh, uh, services and companies providing for the veterinary profession, um uh we we just all need to look out for each other um be respectful and kind to each other and um and be on the journey for each other but at the same time keep know that there are tools out there that we can utilize and apply in our lives and uh in our friends and colleagues as as well um to make our working career and our, our time as veterinarians and, and nurses and technicians and uh, animal care assistants and practice managers, all of the folk within uh, the veterinary community, um, as as good a, uh, as we can, and and then we'll enjoy it more, and then we'll do better work, uh, and better outcomes will arise, and when things go wrong, we'll be able to cope with them better, and hopefully help our our clients to cope with them better as well. Well, thank you for your courageous and vulnerable share. I just um, what struck me when I last spoke to you, you said the profession needs to admit to the morbidity of mental health and do something meaningful about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's um, just like we research any, any clinical case, there's a lot of work that has been done and still needs to be done. But I, I would tend to agree with you. If we can learn the incredible skill that we've learned technically, we can also learn self-care, leadership, business, yeah. emotional fitness. Those are skills that can be learned um yeah they have real real value no I, th I think the morbidity is the really serious issue actually mm -hmm. um uh, i really do it's and and you, we're suffering in silence an awful lot of people are suffering in yeah. silence and mm -hmm. um and we've got to really really understand um and respect each other the the recent um uh, the British Small Animal Veterinary Association conference in, in uh, Manchester last week um, had a whole session on wellness um, mm. and uh, they ran an excellent workshop on um, uh, th th these issues and, and how we, sh you know, what, what people might have experienced um, uh, but either working within the clinic from the internal um, folk there or, or externally um, and it's it's really key for us to just reboot the way uh, we think about each other um and uh and, and and i think there are there are lots of different ways that we can explore and make it better um one of the, one of the surprising ways um uh, was revealed to me when i spoke to a few folk from the veterinary emergency group in um the states um yes, at the last conference I, I went to over there and I was speaking with them about, um, you know, the, the issue that I think a huge number of practices are suffering, which is retention um, and recruitment. And um, when I started sort of saying to um, the, the person I was speaking to, oh, you know, how are you finding things? Um, because I know in, um, in, in particularly in, in critical care and emergency out of hours work, that's a particular problem. And she started smiling and I said, um, why? What's the smile for? And she said, I don't want to say this too loudly, Mark, but actually this is one of the issues that we aren't experiencing. Um, and I said, really? Um, and she said, no, really. And she said, it's because we have a particular way of handling our cases. And the way we do it, it's not going to work for everyone, but we have literally an open room where all of the cases are dealt with. And everybody is in that room and uh so the there may be adjacent um the tables um where the and it's all companion animal obviously um that these companion animals are being um uh, 
assessed and treated in adjacent tables with the clients adjacent to the table as well. And she said that is in her experience, in her situation, she said, you know, I can't make it work for everyone, but this is the situation for us. Having the clients and their, and their friends and other you know, colleagues with it um, are welcomed into it. They're on the same journey as that animal is. Um, the, uh, the clinical team looking after that animal is respectful of the, of the uh, context of having the pet parents there too. And so the way things are phrased and said to each other um, and the way it is shared with the client have a massive difference compared to the way things may be done in other situations. And mm -hmm. she said at the end of the shift, whether things have gone well or badly, one has a different feeling about the case uh, the, the cases that we worked on during that shift because we have shared that journey with them and the pet and the clients and the pet parents have been with us as well there's no hierarchy between vets and nurses there's no um disrespectful comments in any direction at all and as a result we all actually enjoy working in that environment and have a very much higher level of satisfaction um, uh, than might otherwise be expected. And I just thought that was, that was fascinating. And I've shared it with a few other folk that I spoke to in the last few weeks. And they said, um, yeah, I can see how that might work, but we're all in isolated rooms in, in a Victorian huge, building. You know, we can't huge, do that. Huge emotional maturity. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, but it, you know, again, it, it was, it was an interesting idea. And I just, it, it's obviously not going to work for everyone. And it may just be a, a feature of that culture in America. And it's hard to copy ideas from others and apply them in, into mm -hmm. situations where that may not work physically. But the, the concept of sharing that journey with people um, and making that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and making them feel as though they're involved with it. But also, I thought this was really interesting. She said, the dynamic between the clinical team um, was harmonized. There wasn't any uh, hierarchy stuff um, and disrespectful, you know, whatever, whatever. And uh, everyone was in the same room. And so there were different tables being worked on with different folk. Everybody had the same, um, you know, it, it just leveled things and made the kindness and respect thing come more strongly through than in other situations and you know that was just another example of something I just thought that's very interesting to to hear um and a chance conversation I think, at a call. I think what you're saying there is so true compared to um when I was certainly a, a younger veterinarian things are a lot more open and exposed because of social media access yeah. to information so there, there's no place to hide anyway all your results radiographs are put out there into the ether yep. anyone can see them so there's none of this hiding stuff um no. and it it does require a high level of emotional maturity to work in the, in that environment but i just i love the work of um, amy edmondson um psychological safety and safety doesn't mean um you have to mind your p's and q's it means you have to speak your truth <laughs> And if you can sure. do that in any environment at any level, that's when the real um, power of the team comes out, both emotionally, psychologically, um, economically as well, because um, yeah. you need to really listen to your team. Yeah. Mark, yeah. If, um, if you think back over all your years and you had to give advice to a young veterinarian, and I've asked one of the previous podcast guests this question so I'd be interested in your answer and just quick off the cuff um what um advice would you give a young veterinarian especially in those early years from zero to six seven ten years into the business what what would you focus on I guess I guess the key uh to it to one's life in a in any working thing is to actually try and do something that you're going to enjoy now i was lucky in that i knew damn well i was not interested in working in clinical work for companion animals because i was very good at it i didn't really 
uh, and my preference was was horses. Um, and so I was determined that my first job would not be anything other than horses. And everyone giggled a bit and said, well, good luck with that. Um, but I found a, um, a, a practice where that did. Um, uh, and the Milbourne Equine uh, practice in Kent, Ashford, uh, Peter Cantor took me on as a new grad, which was almost unheard of. Um, so from your species passion first. Yeah. So that, well, or whatever your passion is, my passion was horses. Now, what I really enjoyed about doing it also was educating and um, and talking with the clients. That's what I think I was probably best at. Technically, I'm not a surgeon um, and I developed some skills in, in anesthesia and critical care, I hope, when I joined in, in, in the practice in Newmarket. But fundamentally, I was doing the type of work, dealing with the type of animal that was, was of interest to me. And I guess one of the things that concerns me about uh, the way we're educating vets at the moment, veterinarians at the moment, is that we're forced to be all things to all men, all species, yet we have to be graduating in absolutely everything. Um, and I think that's just not practical. Um, and uh, we'd be better off to have the fundamentals of the science of veterinary medicine, um, but actually to then graduate into an area where the species group, where we're particularly likely to be interested and um, we could either go into a specialist area fairly early in our education or stay as a GP if you want to but I think I, I would encourage some in some way for people to be given the, uh, the, the, the clinical time in topics that are really relevant to um, their interest if they have them and I did and I just wasn't interested in doing a lot of farm work or, or small animal work would I therefore uh, what would happen if I suddenly changed direction and wanted to go back into small animals for because I'd had an injury or something else? Well, okay, but um, that would not have been um, uh, a uh, that would not have uh, mattered if I could then retrain in some way um, and um, and 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 you know go about getting re um, retrained, I guess. So I, I think going into something and um, uh, on a, a fundamental basis to start with, um, to continue doing that sort of thing um, if you can. But fundamentally, I think we should really find someone who's going to um, mentor us and coach us and help us along the journey. Um, and I was very lucky with Tim Greet, who was really quite, you know, one of my, you know, fundamental friends in life. Um, and we shared that journey um, uh, very strongly all, all the way through. Um, uh, and and I, I benefited enormously for that, but it didn't stop me burning out, but it did stop me probably burning out sooner than I might otherwise have done. <laughs> so um, I would also encourage people um, to keep their outside interests, if at all possible, um, uh, and uh, and or develop hobbies and interests that take you away from veterinary medicine because it's it is a narrow field and it is work 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 um uh, i would also encourage folk to um not let themselves get isolated your friends and colleagues and family i would share with them uh how you're getting on quite frankly um and listen to the advice you might get because you know, you might not find it very easy to share those uh, experiences with people, um, uh, but it's going to help you go go forwards. And don't assume that you're going to be doing what you started doing um, when you uh, set out on this journey of veterinary medicine for the rest <laughs> of your life. I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> I look at you, Larry, and I'm smiling because I know damn well you haven't. Um, I know damn well I've I've got in I've done first opinion work uh, in equine I've done referral uh, mm. uh, work um, made a arguably made a bit of a hash of that went into research and realised that wasn't for me um, uh, and uh, academia as well I thought whoops that's not uh, it's not going to be fruitful let's not spend time doing that um, and so I ended up in the in a publishing business um, uh, where I think I'm probably better than I was um uh destined to do um and and so be embrace the journey don't feel that you need to be wearing you know as my 
dear father and his two brothers would do going to work in London wearing a bowler hat and an umbrella for the rest of their life working for an insurance company you know you don't have to do that actually that raises an interesting point I would also <laughs> recommend uh people um to do uh to to do some personality profiling yes oh, <laughs> I I did um uh, I think it's called uh, Wealth Dynamics. Um, uh, Alan Robinson helped me do it um, uh, from from uh, Vet Dynamics was in the in the UK, and you basically find out when what's what you like doing, what your what your what your zone is, and it's become pretty clear to me. It might be clear to a few folk um, listening to this podcast that I'm not really a very typical vet, um, and. <laughs> Lots of other vets like doing things in a sequence and in a timely manner and go through it, it all being planned and have other um, folk um, working for them. Um, and in my situation, I am a screaming creator. Um, uh, I'm nothing to do with, I cannot bear the idea of doing five anesthesias in a day or 15 lame horses. Um, mm. I, that's just too straight you know it's it's just not my thing um mm. i prefer going into a a room of people i don't know a soul um or going to a conference i've never been to before and um you know just finding my way through um conversations and meeting people opportunities that i can then come back to to bring to my either my own life or uh, the business um and scare the pants off them with another crazy idea um but you know how on earth are we going to do that mark you know for goodness sake can't you just leave things for a while instead <laughs> can't, variety, can't, can't creativity yeah interesting yeah i i uh, just yeah i um i i love i love exactly what you said i think that early on in the in the career path it is essential that you really understand your own behavior profile yep. your own energy style yep. um i've recently yeah, are you, you know, yeah. what you're going to be good at i you know are you someone who's going to deal with and handle people because guess what most of your professional life if you're in practice in many types <laughs> of practices it's going to be dealing with uh with folk and if you don't want to do that and you want to be you know a, a technician then go into something quite quickly and maybe it's orthopedic surgery or soft tissue surgery where it doesn't really matter that you're not as brilliant a communicator as you could be because there are going to be others in the team around you who are going to see the cases and refer the cases into you or whatever but those people who are brilliant at communicating are going to be uh, not so good at um at, at doing the the technical aspects the diagnostic and surgical procedures um it always used to amuse me and i was uh, as i mentioned earlier i went to cambridge and everyone was called a, a lecturer in whatever it was poultry medicine or um uh, orthopedics well actually if you spoke to most of them the last thing on earth they wanted to do was to to provide lectures they wanted to do clinical caseload they wanted to do their referral stuff they want to do research but they couldn't be given a job saying that they were doing that they had to be given the job role lecturer and they were going through the motions because and they didn't really like doing the lecturing thing um mm. but they had to do that um and, and actually their passion was to do the actual techniques and the and seeing the cases so i think again you know uh, in um in, in your in your life Find out what sort of person you are. There are some really amazingly good tools um, uh, that are well known, like the Myers Briggs or the any of these other ones. Do a few of these. Invest in yourself. The amount of money you've invested in your training for clinical work for a few hundred pounds, you can find out a hell of a lot more about what sort of person you really are, not what mm -hmm. you think you are, but what you really are. And it was only in the last probably maybe eight years have I realized that I'm not suited for for doing clinical work and I'm much more suited <laughs> to be a because I'm more of a creator person and then I yeah. hand things over to to the guys who are going to who are going to be able to handle how they're going to do it and then the other folk who are going to be um uh, what are we going to do to make this happen and then the other folk within the team who are going to uh, time frame it and and schedule it but I'm I like looking over the far uh, horizon and uh, coming back with ideas and um and and seeing what we can do together um and how i can make 
competitors, collaborators, um, and, um, and and so that's what I've now discovered. Well, it only took me, I don't know how many decades of <laughs> clinical work to, to try and understand that. And how silly is that? So that certainly is something I would uh, very much um, encourage folk to do. Um, what else would I do? Have an animal in your own life. Have animals in your own lives, mm. um, if you possibly can, because the unconditional love that you get from um, an animal, if you have got the, the capacity and the resources to uh, be able to have them in your life, will, uh, will be um, a great uh, source of comfort when things go wrong. And by the way, they will. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not uh, a straight line of, um, of success. Um, in any walk of life so have things around you that are going to take you away from um the, the 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 chosen direction that you're currently on um and uh having an animal in your life is helpful have hobbies uh have fr friends and family around that can support you because again in Newmarket, i found it quite professionally isolating there wasn't anyone else there were one or two people as lovely dr polly taylor who was a great um, a friend and, and supporter and mentor of mine, James Wood, when I was doing my a PhD, who rescued me. I mean, I, I remember walking into his office when I'd been, my PhD had been turned down twice, one for being completely irrelevant to, uh, you know, whatever, and the other one just being too long. And uh, I walked in to, to see uh, James and James said, Mark, you know, I, I've watched you do this and can I be frank? And I said, you can be as frank as you like. And he said, I think, I think we're going to start all over again. Um, you've got the data with all of the analysis. Have you got the, have you got the, 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 um, you know, the drive for that? Have you, are you going to do, I said, I'm up for this. I've got the data I've got, I know is so important that I will do what it takes. And he said, right, well, we're going to shut the book on the lovely bound uh, version of your PhD thesis that you thought you'd written, and we're going to do it all over again with the analysis. I said, that's that's exactly fine. I, I know that what I've got now currently isn't there. And he, bless him, um, uh, helped me get through that uh, and guided me all the way through doing the right thing. Um, and so having these people in your life, uh, lives that are going to call it out when you're um, not going well or support you when you need to have supported or um, and, and don't don't give up on yourself because you've got lots of ability. Another important person was mm -hmm. uh, Nick Day, Professor Nick Day at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge, um, who was a man of not very many words. Um, and uh, I respected him as a result of that. You don't get to be professor of biostatistics at University of Cambridge uh, um, without being pretty damn good at what you do. And, and Nick Day was one of those really amazing people. And I remember him sitting down with me uh, after I'd been there. I was the only vet in the whole place. The rest were biostatisticians and doctors in um, with with massive you know epidemiology uh, qualifications. And he said, Mark, I know you're doing interesting work. I want you to bring your data tables uh, to me. And I don't want any labels on them that I can understand or mean anything to me. But the four by four, you know, four by twos um, or eight by twos, whatever it is, um, tables, just bring them all in. Um, and I want to allocate some time and sit down with you. And I said, well, Nick, that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, and he had no reason to do that. He was head of the department. There's no reason for him to really bother with some, uh, uh, you know, irritating vet in the in the department. Anyway, he sat down with me and he he just stroked his beard and murmured to himself for an hour. And I sat there trying to look interested and not really understanding what he was doing. And he just turned the pages of the data sets and just went through and went through and went through. Mm, mm. And again, absolutely no, no communication with me at all. So it's, it's hard to know how long that's going to go on. And it's also hard to know whether the guy's thinking, oh my goodness me, what have we got here? This is a catastrophe or, and actually what he did say at the end of that period is, right, there are four tables in this data set that I don't understand. And these are incredibly meaningful. This one, this one, this one, and this one. What is? What are these? If they're linked, we've got something really extraordinary here. 
and um and so i said well actually uh <laughs> um professor day this is this is quite intriguing and he said why and i said well because those are folds all of all of those uh, animals that you that the tables relate to foals and um it's also relating to how they are anesthetized whether they're given a certain um sedatives um uh, ace promazine being the uh one and he said yes yes which one's the ace promazine and i said well it's this one and he said but there are no deaths here mark there are no deaths with this what is this medication and i said well it's not a very fashionable medication. Um, uh, it's not, in fact, um, many drug com pharmaceutical companies are not even thinking of making it very for very much longer. And he went, okay, so that's interesting. What else is interesting? And I said, well, it, it's the combination or whether that medication is used on its own. There are no deaths associated with it. And he said, exactly, exactly. Why? And, and what are these foals? What are they being operated on for? And I said, well, some of them are for very minor operations and very short procedures. And he said, okay, okay, right, what else, what else? Well, I said, well, um, this table is when they're being anesthetized with um, inhalational induction agents. So they're having a tube uh, passed up their nose with halothane coming in. And he said, well, okay, um, but there are, there are deaths there. What about this one? There's, there's, there's virtually no deaths in this one. What, what are they getting? And I said, well, they're getting an intravenous combination of induction agents one or more um, in different uh, uh, combinations. And he said, but there are no deaths there, Mark. And I said, exactly. Um, uh, and uh, um, those, he said, the, these, the, these data, they're all, you know, if these are tables that are related. And I said, well, yeah. He said, you've either made this up or else there's something really interesting going on here. And it's now become pretty obvious, isn't it? That if you think about it, and you know, thank you, Nick Day, for, for helping me see it through this amazing uh, collection of thousands of, of uh, horses being anesthetized, that if you take a foal away from its mother, you don't give it uh, ace promazine um, and, you, uh, and, it's, uh, and you're taking it away, it will be quite badly stressed quite quickly because you've taken it away from its mother. It's not sedated, so it's really not understanding what's, what's going on. Um, and then you hold it while you pass a tube up its nose and you give it um, a substance like halothane, which isn't uh, innocuous. Um, guess what you also probably have done is uh, at that time may have given it an alpha-2 agonist like xylazine or dutomidine, which of course slows the heart rate down significantly, as well as sedating the brain. Well, this animal is breathing extremely fast because it's distressed. It hasn't got its mother. Um, you've given it an alpha-2 agonist, and now you're going to stick a tube up its nose to make its distress even further. But you haven't given it ace promazine, which is fairly capable of uh, 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 protecting the heart against some dithrhythmias. What a surprise when those animals, 20 minutes into a, uh, a, a general anaesthetic, may incur an unexpected cardiac arrest a relative overdose because their respiratory rate is high, their heart rate is slow, therefore the halothane is quickly reaching a relative overdose. Um, and these animals were um, surprisingly, until one had looked at the data, experiencing cardiac arrests in a totally normal situation. They may have had an ectropion being uh, done or uh, you know some other minor procedure. Um, and they were dying 20 to 30 minutes into their general anaesthetic and people going huh so now it's almost unheard of to um use inhalational um induction um in in uh, foals and uh, the use of ace promazine being highly protective um in many situations and ace promazine is still not a very fashionable uh, uh medication but it's certainly extremely um was shown to be quite protective and there's something weird about horses, which again, Polly Taylor identified, which is their fight and flight response. They don't respond well to inhalational anesthesia um, and they show stress almost immediately. You start giving them some of these uh, uh, pharmaceuticals like uh, mm. halothane. Um, and so you're, you're throwing a massive amount of pharmacological stress at them, as well as depriving them of their mother and giving them uh, uh, not exactly innocuous substances. Probably not a great surprise that we had some catastrophes. So 
you know, the 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 insight and the the encounter of dealing with people uh, and and ex and being open to people like Nick Day, who you know just was offering his time and um, uh, was just instrumental in me making sense out of the data that that James Wood had helped me collect and analyze properly, and that Polly hit Taylor had started me down on the journey. So, you know, those people in the profession are out there. Um, uh, stay close to people who want to talk with you and support you because they will enable your career to flourish um, uh, from a clinical uh, and career point of view and stay close to people who value you as a person um, and, uh, and, in, and try and enjoy your profession. And if you're not enjoying it, don't be afraid to make a change. Um, and you've got so much to offer. The other, the other lovely bit of advice I was given, I remember when uh, a particular moment in my career, commercial uh, uh, career happened when a, 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 a transaction didn't go through a, a management buyout thing. And someone said to me, um, Mark, you need to know one thing. And I said, oh, what, uh, really? Um, I'm up for anything today. It's not been a great day. And they said, no, you're, you're a bird um, and you have dreams <laughs> and you are on the edge of a cliff and you're looking over that cliff and uh, it's not a great view, is it? And I went, <laughs> no, it isn't. And he said, but you're a bird. And all you need to do is open your wings and let the uplift uh, uh, get under your wings and it will take you somewhere. And it will take you somewhere. It may not be perfect to start with, but it will take you somewhere and it will give you confidence that you will go somewhere different. Um, and you'll land maybe further down uh, in height, maybe a different uh, part of wherever it is, but you'll land safely mm -hmm. because you've got wings. And then if you're then able to go, well, actually this isn't quite what I thought it was, open your wings again, use the uplift uh, of the air coming through and you'll land somewhere else. And I've, uh, I've really found that incredibly useful as a metaphor. Um, and uh, there are several times in my life and, and in uh, colleagues where I've uh, told that story and it to me has been a very uh, insightful, helpful situation when uh, around me, the, certainly the, 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 the dark forces were, um, were circling a little bit and, and I suddenly mm -hmm. realized that actually there was plenty of other stuff out there that, that I could enjoy. Um, so, sorry, that's a long answer to a quick question. I've written all of them down and made 10 of them, and you'll see, <laughs> and you'll see it in the summary. <laughs> because I think, I think sometimes we focus, what you focus on is what you get. So be careful yeah. what you're focusing on. Yes. And if we're constantly focusing on the problems in the profession, the anxiety, the stress, the yeah. horrible suicide, yeah. Where what you've mentioned, there are some very wise um, alternative approaches to offer a young person to support them because they're going to go through this journey. Oh yeah, and <laughs> and, and shit will and, happen. Yeah, will happen. I, no doubt. What what's in the way is the way. Um, sometimes it'll break you. Sometimes it'll make you. And um, I always think God's a mean chess player when you get there and he says to you, what have you done, my son? And I say, everything. He'll be a lot happier than if you haven't approached it. So you ask the question, what have I done since I stopped clinical work? Well, there's just so many wonderful things to do within the profession still. So Yeah, yeah, yeah there are. But, but we're drilled into thinking. I mean, I, I, again, sorry, a slightly personal story, but I think it illustrates the point. My mum, my dad, literally, I've seen pictures of my christening and it seems a bit of a joke now, but they were all wearing bowler hats and, <laughs> and umbrellas at my, christ at my christening. I've seen the pictures at Michael's Church in London and I went, bloody hell. And that was back in 62. Well, that's what men did then. And so my mum, right? So dad died when I was 10, as I've disclosed already. Mum was quite a traditional uh, person too. So she... She was so proud of the fact that I got into and, and no one was more surprised than me when I got in. But she was so <laughs> you could see, you know, I did work pretty hard to get into um, to vet school at Cambridge. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and when I got there, she, you know, she, that was her dream. And when I 
Uh, and then the next stage of her dream was that I should be in equine practice um, because that's what, you know, she thought that that was it. And then the next stage of her dream was that I should, um, which I managed to get a job in, in Newmarket. And then she aspired to me being a partner um, at this practice in Newmarket. And I remember saying to mum, she she did come up and, and uh, come round with me a few for a few days and uh, see what it was like um, in practice. And I remember saying to her at the end of that pit, Mum, you know what? I'm I'm done here um, because she said, "Darling, what do you mean?" And I said, "Well, if I carry on much longer, I'm not. Sure. It was this was pretty unfair, but I, I had to shake her up a bit." I said, "Mum, if I carry on very much longer, I'm not sure I'm going to be here anymore." <laughs> Now, I was saying that to someone whose husband had taken their life and I was not I was not hiding um, my uh, my words. And uh, she said, what on earth? What do you mean? Um, she said, what, what am I going to tell everyone on the cocktail party circuit in, in Gloucestershire? I said, I don't give a shit what you tell everyone on the cocktail party <laughs> circuit in Gloucestershire. Um, uh, you know, I don't, it's just not of any interest to me at all. And what is of interest is that I probably have a few youngsters um, three members of my um, family of uh, daughters, um, a wife, and um, and I'm still on this planet. Um, I'm going to find something else to do. And and her mindset was, you know, umbrella, uh, bowler hat, work for one company for the rest of your life. And that was that's. I, I'm not blaming her. I'm not criticizing her. That was her mindset. That was, you know, the way she was brought up. Um, and her expectations were you join the best practice you possibly could in the country and you stay there and you become a partner and um, you get your gold clock at the end of it when you retire. And I was, you know, bouncing all over the place saying I hated this and I wanted to do that and still within the profession, but not not really as far as she was concerned. I was being a bit of a weirdo. Um, and uh, so you have to. You have to just. Um, not think in a straight line and and be able to see that there are plenty of other things you can do with an amazing qualification that we're blessed with mm -hmm. um and uh and and you know enjoy the journey as much as we can and um, um and also enjoy life and if i think if we fundamentally do that then there's a chance that we'll we'll do interesting good work that we'll be proud of and that will make a difference to the lives of um, of, of the folk that we come across whose animals we care for um, and we'll have plenty of tussles on the way um, there's a whole podcast of stories of what I could tell you about life in Newmarket and, and how to deal with them <laughs> oh my goodness um, but that won't surprise you in fact I, I remember coming to the um, equine practitioners group in South Africa uh, um, uh, uh, to talk about anesthesia of horses and things and one of the guys said to us um, uh you know we were talking about things afterwards and um over a beer or something and he said you know I, I remember saying this is amazing you have the same issues thousands of miles away as we do in Newmarket this is completely bizarre um that we have the same things life is not different it's just the context um 100%. I, it was just incredible you know the bad debtors the appalling behavior um, the unethical questions they expected me to do, all this shit. It was just mm. unbelievable. Um, so, you, you know, and the same thing is life will, uh, you know, come up with all sorts of uh, variables that you're not expecting. Um, and some of them will be really good and others will be completely horrible. Um, but you need to stand, you know, stand and, uh, and, and cope with them by looking after yourself and seeing what you can do um to to help you on this journey um and and then you'll get value out of it and you'll be a better person um and a member of the profession emotional fitness is about your ability to deal with uncertainty that's it, it certainly <laughs> is oh yeah mark thank you so much